I'm Grim Grindle, and we've ended here on a bit of a high. After all, the washer dryer run through Rusty Bucket Bay has thus far, up until extremely recently, been going less than optimal. We have died more times than I can count. Wait, scratch that, there's no upper limit to how high I can count. What I really meant to say is we've died more times than I care to count. I could have counted if I had chosen to, I'm actually quite a good counter. Speaking of which, this is Wash and Dry Rusty Bucket Bay Part 5, see that? I counted that just fine. And you can count on things being on the up and up. After all, following much failure, we've finally had some success. I am of course referring to the crown jewel of the previous episode in which we finally broke the dry spell and got ourselves a jiggy. And so, as you can no doubt see, I am once more with newfound confidence, venturing into the engine room of Rusty Bucket Bay and hoping this time it won't end in horrific tragedy. I have managed to identify what went wrong in the previous 43 attempts, that's a guesstimate, and it seems to be the main problem is me falling to my death. So I'm going to try my best to this time and not do that. But Grim, you say, isn't simply not die kind of weak advice to give. After all, everyone dies eventually. And to that I say, no, not necessarily, as, whoa, well, granted, historically everyone who's ever died failed to keep living, contrarily everyone currently alive has never died, and so there is in fact a chance that they are indeed immortal. And if you really think about it, if someone was immortal, they'd be more likely alive than dead, and so it's far more likely that someone alive right now is indeed immortal, rather than someone who's dead from a historical human past being immortal. But there are some unfortunate unforeseen downsides to living forever that few foresee or stop to consider, and I'm not simply referring to the fact that once all time ends, you're going to be awfully lonely for an extremely long time, but instead, if you are immortal, you've got plenty more time to make stupid mistakes. For instance, getting halfway through the engine room and realizing you've not pounded the propeller's propulsion preventing pillar on the other side of the pallet, and you're going to have to turn back and do it all again. So let's fast forward through all of that nonsense and get ready for a take two. And we are back at regular speed, which means that all I have to do is jump through this fan here, collect four music notes, and jump through the fan again, and I will never again in my life as a washer dryer have to re-enter this godforsaken engine room. Which I admittedly am currently extremely nervous about, I don't want to make a minor mistake and misjudge the highly misleading surface area of the washer dryer and accidentally hop to my doom while doing something comparatively simple to what I've done before, and so I'm taking things about as slow as a 1930s black and white film feels to a modern audience. One might say that I'm even going too slow and that I'm being over cautious, but to them I say you go do the engine room a million times and see how fast you are to act. But fortunately, this time for me, I've actually made it through. And I've got to say, I couldn't be more pleased about it. It's now time to set my sight on new horizons, new things, and hopefully never have to come back here again. It's been fun. Kind of, but not really, mostly just stressful, and it's a good thing I had no hair on my head to begin with, otherwise I'm not sure I would have any left. And so, much like Santa Claus having unloaded his sack full of elvish slave labor built toys under the bowl of the most recent victim of humanity's widespread deforestation to be opened by the needy ungrateful offspring of a capitalist cog, I make my way up the chimney and into the cool air of my overpolluted environment. But unlike Santa there is waiting for me on the roof and or deck, not a bunch of magical reindeers, but instead the lust for further adventure. And further, unlike Santa, who by the way I am only speculating here, would likely plan to go on and continue to spread joy, I instead am intending to go and promptly blow something up. Mainly because while the actions of Santa Claus are largely motivated by a healthy mixture of Christianity, Nordic mythology and sugar plums and fairies, mine is mainly motivated by the rules of cinematography and dramatic principle. Which means that, much like Chekhov's gun, you simply cannot have a giant box of dynamite sitting on the screen mid-center for a certain amount of time before you simply must blow it up. And I've got to say, I'm darn glad I did so, because that was a pretty impressive explosion. I mean, not only was it big with plenty of bloom and some particles flying around and broken wood and whatnot, but it's also blown the cover off of the cargo hold, which means as far as explosions go, it was also rather functional. And I do intend to go down into the cargo hold, in fact I'll even do it this episode, I just have to first talk up the confidence, because, well, cargo holds have been known to sometimes be rather dangerous. 
I mean, has anyone seen Jurassic Park 3 where the dinosaur was in the cargo hold? Or what about most of the King Kong movies? I think it can be said that cargo holds are the under the bed or the closet of a ship, and usually it's going to contain a monster. But Grim, you say? Haven't you passed this game multiple times before? Isn't your pretending to not know what's down there a weekly presented facade? And isn't your professed confusion about what lies around the corner in this game wildly inconsistent throughout this series? To which I say, Hush you, I'm trying to build up some cinematic tension here. Also, before anyone points it out and says, Grim, you got it wrong, that wasn't Jurassic Park 3, you were thinking of a different movie. You're probably right. Now that I think about it, that might have been Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World I was thinking of, or maybe Aliens. Man, there really are a lot of movies where monsters are in cargo holds. Everyone leave their favourite monster in a cargo hold movie in the comments below, and maybe we can be watch Mojo into releasing a top 10 list of the best monsters in cargo holds movies. Actually, on second thoughts, scratch that, let's be honest, they've probably already done it. Oh, and while I dive down into the cargo hold, I should mention that I did just pound a Gruntilda switch, I was just too caught up with what I was saying to comment on it. Monsters aside, the true horror found within this cargo hold is how this shipping company chooses to transport eggs. If there was any kind of rough weather, there's no way any of these eggs would reach their destination. Monsters not aside, however, who would have expected there to be a monster within this cargo hold? I certainly did not see it coming myself, and I can't help but wonder how many of these Hydra-like offsprings must I slay before this episode is officially considered an unboxing video. I've always somewhat chuckled that the game designers have boxed in the box's unboxing arena with a row of eggs on all sides as if to suggest that that's the best method to take down this enemy. Whereas, as you can see, if you just use the golden feather to go invincible for a bit, well, the battle doesn't even last as long as this explanation. And so with that, another GE's gone got, which brings us to four in Rusty Bucket Bay and to the end of this episode. And so, as always, thanks for watching, and until next time, I have been and still am Grim Grindle. If you would like to join the Channel Grim and Grim Discord, the Echo Chamber, a link to that, is available in the description below.